Let's look back a couple of weeks to the G7 summit in the UK, where that group appeared to push back on China, particularly in the areas of human rights and, of course, trade again. Uh, do you think that we're going to see a US-led coalition trying to contain one country? And amongst these G7 allies, is there actually a consensus on China? Well, you are right uh, on one side that the United States of Washington has been quite intensively trying to form a coalition against China. And Washington these days, they have conjured up the so-called a democracy versus autocracy rhetoric. This is us and them rhetoric. Either you are with the US or you are with China. We also find that there's a differences between those G7 countries over how to understand or approach China. So I think that even if there's a, some growing concern among G7 countries uh, about their about the human rights issues or trade issues vis-a-vis -vis China. But at the same time, I think that those other countries, particularly the European countries like Germany or France, they do not accept the idea that the containment of China is the right answer towards the so-called China's problem. They also reject the idea of decoupling. Not only that, we have seen that China is the, one of the biggest trade partners with the European countries. And with regard to some other transnational challenges like climate change, Iran nuclear issues, uh, countering the pandemic, as well as many other uh, global challenges, Europeans as a whole regard China as a very important partner. It is very difficult for the United States to try to forge a coalition against China. I mean, the G7 says it stands for democracy, for inclusion, for multilateralism. But I think, aren't we not in danger again of having an elite club of global North countries uh, shaping the narrative for the entire world? No country or a club of country could form a real kind of a dominant narrative which will dominate the world political economy. This is the reality. So I think that when, when China refers to the idea of the diversification of the cultural or the dialogue between and across the different cultures, it means that the narratives of today's world are diversified. We are already in a post-hegemonic era and no country or group of countries narrative can control or dominate at all. Professor Chen, it deeply saddens me and many people, I'm sure yourself, to see the US-China relationship going through such a deeply contentious period. This despite high-level conversations between people like Janet Yellen and Vice Premier Liu He, Anthony Blinken, who spoke face-to-face -face with Politburo member Yang Jiechi. Still, there seems to be no clear way forward. What is the way forward then, from your perspective? Both sides need to, as quick as possible, in good faith to resume the strategic dialogue. Secondly, I also think that it's very important that both sides should focus on their domestic reform because it's very dangerous. It is also useless to try to outsource the domestic problems by seeking an external scapegoat. And thirdly, I think that uh, it is very important for both sides to try to rebuild, to rebuild a fundamental framework governing the bilateral relationship, that without the collaboration in good faith between Washington and Beijing, no problem of the world will be solved permanently. Professor Chen, we presume the United States and China to be the two major players today. Of course, they're the two major economies, and they sit alongside each other as permanent members of the UN Security Council. But what fascinates you about the relationship, and why should we care so much about what American and Chinese ordinary people do together. I remember when I was still a, a young guy, about uh, uh, eight or seven years old, many, many years ago, the first picture which has really impressed me was an American uh, fictionary uh, story about the future of the world. And this film deeply impressed me about how sciences and the technology can transform the world. I began to understand that the China could not close its door 
Even during that period, I was still uh, in my only primary school. Uh, I know that it's very important for China to, to open its book and for Chinese people to have a more understanding about what is going on outside. So I think that partially my fascination about US-China relationship for so many years was actually triggered or initiated by that film when I was very young. But I still believe that such kind of a film really impacted me so deeply. The next generation, our children, for example, have that huge advantage because of the work of the generation that came before. How should they take advantage of it? And what would you tell American and Chinese young people to do, especially as formal people-to-people exchanges are on hold? If we are too obsessed with the so-called identity politics, then even if we are living in a digitalized world, even if we have a chance to access so many information, but we will confine ourselves to a very narrowly-minded framework of the world. I think young people, whether you are in Washington, or whether you're in Beijing, or in Shanghai, or in New York, we have to recognize that the world has changed a lot. The emerging technology, they also transform our world, but they are still have a kind of a negative consequences, the so-called disruptive effect. Can we work together to manage those new challenges? Or when we are living in a much better world, quite a higher living standard, like Shanghai people or New York people, but still there are quite a number of people in a less developed or much vulnerable world. They are still suffer from a deep hit by the pandemic. Can the young people in China, in the United States can work together to deal with those challenges? So I really call for those people to try to continue to see the connection between each other in this new context. We are living in the same world. Professor Chen, I can't let you go without talking about the major event on July 1st, when 1.4 billion people honored the 100th birthday of the Communist Party of China. On that event, President Xi Jinping signaled a foreign policy that would be less tolerant of unilateralism. But he also, in the same spirit, talked about uh, building a shared community for humanity. Not the first time he's talked about that. For anyone who's not in China, who, who doesn't really understand what happens, what should they anticipate in terms of the world to come? What is the real key challenge facing the humankind as a whole? And what is the right way to deal with these challenges? Is this the real challenge? Is the so-called ideology-based competition between the United States and China? Or is this the real challenge? Is so-called a US-China competition for hegemon? Beijing or Prince Xi do not think that way. And he himself, as well as CPC as a whole, believe the real challenge is whether the world, the humankind as a whole, could deal with those common challenges like pandemic, climate change, refugee, or food security through uniting all the forces together. So this is the questions that Prince Xi is trying to convey to the world. President Chen Dongxiao of the Shanghai Institutes of International Studies, it's an enormous pleasure speaking with you today and we thank you for the time you've given us. Thank you, thank you.